Do we have nulls? All right, now we're live. Sorry about the little delay. We are live it's today with uh, myself, Taylor Marshall, Timothy Gordon, and our guest, Michael Knowles. I first, oh, I, I've kind of tracked Michael Knowles for a while, and then he went crazy when he was licking the cake, like Miley Cyrus. <laughs> that was hilarious. I, I, I got that. I got that image. We'll throw it up later. Um, so, Michael, I think, welcome. You know, my, my wife loved that one. I think she hasn't been able to get that image out of her mind, unfortunately, <laughs> but maybe she'll be able to see it again and it'll go right back right. in. It's what? her and the rest of America and the world. <laughs> so, congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. 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 So, um, so, Michael Knowles, welcome. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you wrote the book on, uh, on the, uh, what was the title of it? The reasons to vote, vote for Democrats. Yep. Reasons to vote for Democrats. Lots of good research in there. Lots of facts, right? You know, you're using the word wrote very uh, generously, <laughs> so I appreciate that. I had been researching that book for my entire life, and then I wrote it in about 25 seconds with a, a long bibliography and foreword, and then, of course, uh, 250 blank pages. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing in it. Uh, ben Shapiro <laughs> wrote that it was thorough. That's right. <laughs> and uh, President Trump uh, said that it was a great book for your reading enjoyment. So I know people say that the president's not a reader. I know for a fact right. he has read at least my book. He's read the entire <laughs> thing, the entire thing. So, uh, yeah, it's just a book with blank pages, folks. There are no reasons to vote for the Democrats. So, yeah, how did right. you pitch that to your publisher? Yeah, how did you I, get I, that? I, that's one thing I wanted because I mean that's a good that's a that's a solid deal for you, the author. <laughs> these were these were in the the great old days when you could uh, up to an Amazon Direct publisher, it would go out immediately to the largest uh, marketplace in the world. You didn't have to pay any money, and I did this of all of the ridiculous stunts I've ever been involved in. This one genuinely was just a way to irritate my Democrat friends and relatives. And so I was there one day, I had just gotten engaged a couple weeks earlier, and I was trying uh, 150 blank pages, and I uploaded it just as a lark. And within three days, it becomes the number one best-selling book in the world. My wife, who had told me, Michael, stop wasting your time on this stupid joke. Then, you know, three days later, it could pay for not one but two of our weddings. Uh, I've uh, rarely seen a more on-the-nose manifestation of manna falling from heaven on totally undeserved grace than that uh, book <laughs> occurring right after I got engaged. I mean, How that's... much time could you have been wasting? Like, I know it wasn't that yeah. long. I'm going to complain about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so Michael, one of the things that we're interested in, of course, is Catholicism, and and you've spoken about that before. And I believe you were raised Catholic. Is that right? I was. I was a cradle Catholic, and we went through a varying periods of seriousness. So I'm not going to say we were just always kind of cafeteria Catholic and didn't go to church. There there were seasons in which we were pretty religious and pretty devout, and then fall away. And then by the time I was 13 and I was being confirmed in the church, I was more or less an atheist or certainly a very agnostic. And that for about 10 years. And then I reverted uh, gradually and then suddenly beginning around three. And, and, uh, where would you put yourself as a Catholic? I mean, I know Catholic is Catholic, but yet there are different stripes. So, I mean, do you, are you tend Byzantine or traditional Latin masses or normal parish? Oh, uh, I just love, you know, Are you involved you know, in any, I, any groups like, you know, Thurl or Dominican or any, any of the movements? I find myself really gravitating toward the felt banners and the Dan shoot 70s pop hymns and the acoustic guitars. And when the priest is facing you and telling a ton of ham actor jokes, I find that just so fearing and uplifting that I, I tend to go to the traditional Latin mass. The Norbertines uh, do an excellent job here in Southern California. And I, I do like a, a more reverent Novus Ordo. So really one of the priests who was instrumental in my reversion to the church is Father George Rutler in New York at sure. the Church of St. Michael and just a tremendous man. And that, that mass is a Novus Ordo mass, but it's very reverent at Orientum, lots of chanting. And I, I find that wonderful as well. Uh, you know, 
the just the direction of the priest really does change the direction of of uh, eighty degrees. And the, I only really discovered that around age twenty two or twenty three, I guess, when I was a kid, when I was being raised. I had no exposure whatsoever to the traditional mass or to reverent liturgy. I mean, we really were raised in the era of felt banners and uh, holding hand songs and people just not taking it that seriously. And then while I was off being an arrogant and prideful atheist for 10 years, Pope Benedict XVI issued that modu proprio. And so by the time I was drawn back to come back to the church, I thought, oh my gosh, I had no idea that this actually was beautiful, and uh, that that beauty uh, you know, has, has obviously drawn me, as has the intellectual depth, and then more than anything, the spiritual reality. Yeah. Uh, do you think um, that sort of the the inauthentic presentation of Catholicism with the felt banners and just the laissez-faire going on, do you think that contributed at all to you drifting to atheism or was there something else? Was it more of a, a moral or, or intellectual drift? C certainly. I, I take full responsibility for my own young teenage arrogance and, and deserved a sense of my own cleverness. So I think that was a big part of it. But it is also the case that I rejected the faith as childish in part because I was presented with a childish faith and a childish presentation of the faith. And it, it didn't occur to me until years and years later that there actually was a seriousness, a real tradition. And at that same time, at, you know, this would have been around 2003, there was the sex abuse scandal that disillusioned a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But though it, you know, I, I felt all human institutions are pretty corrupt and broken, so it didn't, that didn't shock me in the way that it shocked some also at that time, there was this publishing fad. I won't call it an intellectual fad, but it was a, a book fad called The New Atheists. And obviously, uh, Daniel Dennett and Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and uh, Sam Harris. And for a precocious, arrogant 13-year-old, those arguments seemed very compelling. I think that is exactly the target audience of The New Atheists, is 13-year-olds who think that they're cleverer than they are. And so over time, you realize that they're really shallow arguments. They're, they're not even making the arguments that they purport to make. It's just all sort of innuendo and insinuation and uh, philosophical shallowness from guy or theology. But uh, I think that is part of it. There's an idea. I got a text message from a professor the other day. I, you know, I guess my phone number is all over the internet. Mm -hmm. And I got a text from him, and it was a great text because he said, Michael, I forget, I'd given a speech somewhere. And he said, Michael, I always thought that religious people were just uneducated. You know, the implication being I'm at least sort of slightly educated. And so uh, he said, but the, the fact that you're interested and you find this compelling means I should look into this more. I think there's a broad idea that religious people are naive or uneducated or stupid and atheists accept the hard, cold reality now rattle only a dozen good arguments for the existence of God, and that would only be the very beginning of the conversation. Whereas if we tried to make a good argument for atheism, I don't think I could come up with a single one. That's, yeah, that's right. And your, your, your homie there, Mr. Ben Shapiro, likes the arguments and has been very drawn over the last couple of years to the arguments of probably, I'd say, the leading luminary against the, the four horsemen, the ridiculous new atheist movement. Uh, Dr. Edward Fazer, you, you yeah. know, um, everywhere I, every time I check in, Shapiro's citing Edward Fazer. It's funny. And yeah, do you guys have conversations about that? I think a lot of Catholics are, you know, watch Shapiro, a very, a bright man with great interest. Like, are you, yeah, are you interested in, in seeing through the full Aristotomist line of reasoning that really just skewers these idiotic atheists? Of course. Uh, ben and I, and all of us at The Daily Wire, have had a lot of religious conversations. Ben just wrote this book called The Right Side of History, uh, basically about how uh, reason and revelation combined to make the West so great. And as he was doing that research, he read a lot of Thomas Aquinas, and I think he was very impressed by Thomas Aquinas. So there was one time back from some event, and I, we were talking about his book, and we were talking about 
religion and civilization. And I said, look, Ben, I'm not going to press the point. I know you've got your religious views. You certainly know what I think, and I'm happy to answer any questions. But if this plane goes down, buddy, I got a glass of water right here, and you are getting doused, all right? That is going to be the insurance policy, so be prepared for it. Baptist, baptism on the way down. Um, <laughs> what did he say? Did he he, uh, he took that graciously. I don't know. <laughs> I, I won't speak for him, but he, uh, he was at least gracious enough in my threat to, uh, to pour a glass of water on his head. For you said, his eternal soul. That's right. Right. No, I know. You, you're doing more and saying more <laughs> on behalf of his eternal soul than uh, the good Bishop Barron when he interviewed him. You know, yeah. there's a lot of, yeah, yeah. Bishop Barron did catch a lot of flack for that. He, he did, uh, you know, in, in a later episode of B the Bishop's Own podcast, he did clarify what he was saying. He did say more on that subject, but uh, he, he, did, he did catch a lot of flack for that. I wished Ben had asked me the question over whether, you know, he was going to eternal torment, because I would have said, of course, that has nothing to do with your religion. That's just guaranteed. But he didn't give me the question, so I didn't, well, didn't get to give the answer. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because Shapiro's a smart guy. I mean, he can, he can handle a bishop laying down some Roman Catholic theology. You know, it's not like he's going to cry and run off the set. I mean, he's a he's a smart guy. So yeah, I would have loved to see. Yeah, it would. Of course, this I wouldn't. I don't think this is uh, an example. You know, obviously Ben has read a zillion books, and he obviously knows what the answers would be. I I do in in Bishop Barron's defense, I do think there is a little bit of a fear of the medium, which is that if you've only got you know, four minutes to explain uh, redemption or something like that, that you're not you're not going to be able to give a full answer. And so you're going to turn a lot of people off. I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't get a crack at the question. I sure wish I had. But <laughs> maybe, maybe next time Ben will bring me back on the Sunday show. Yep. Yeah, good work on the Sunday show, by the way. Was that the first time you'd ever been on? You'd been ha you'd oh, been thank privileged. You. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I was hoping that we would do a show where we just sat and stared at each other and didn't say anything for an hour, and it could have been a public performance of my book. But <laughs> right. alas, he asked questions. Right. Now, now, right. Michael, you mentioned the the Norbertines. Is that the Norbertines down in Orange at St. Michael's? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yep. And they, there's a wonderful uh, yeah, solid. parish down there in Costa Mesa that we go to as well. Yeah. Solid. Very solid. How far is that from you, Tim? Uh, it's a depends on traffic. I can get there. I got from San Diego back home on Tuesday night in three hours here to here to Baco. You, Mike, what's up? You know, I'm in I'm a I'm a Bakersfieldian. and I own it. I own it, dude. See, he's in that, L.A. where they talk smack. On, that's uh, on true. Baco. I, I'm down yeah. here, although, you know, of course, in L.A., uh, all of our friends refer to it as Gamora by the sea. So, you know, it's not right. all uh, all roses here. But right. that, you know, we yeah, we take a little bit of a ride to go to that church because there is a dearth of liturgical reverence, unfortunately, in La La Land. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can go down to the uh, erstwhile promised land over in Orange County. And yeah. there are a lot of wonderful parishes down there. Not quite as erstwhile. You can also head over to St. Therese a little closer to you. With, uh, That's true, Father Philip. Yeah, that, that that place is legit. It's good to be talking to an Angelina. We're usually talking to people on the East Coast. I feel, I feel comforted by by <laughs> seeing seeing an Angelino's uh, head face in our head. Uh, you know, I am I am a transplant, and actually, when I moved from New York, I drove out here. Saint Therese was, was the first church that I started going to. And that was another little bit of a hike. You know, the thing is, in L.A., if you're going to go more than two miles, it's guaranteed to take you 45 minutes. But I, I always really liked it because I would, uh, I know you guys were talking, I think in the last stream, about the presence of Christ in the Eucharist and how some people, you know, would just stay at home otherwise and listen to to, uh, Father Rutler's homilies in the car ride there, you know, or, or the car ride back, maybe smoking a cigar. The body is a temple. The temple needs incense. So you can definitely make <laughs> use of that L.A. traffic for uh, spiritual good or harm. Now, Michael, yeah. I read that you, you got married last year. Is that right? That's right. All right. So uh, let's talk about that. Marriage, Catholic marriage, kind of a, uh, you know, we're told as guys, hey, marriage, there's nothing in it for you in marriage. You know, there's... There's a lot of men's rights groups, the MGTOW group, all of these guys, uh, kind of the red pill male group that see marriage now because of feminism as, as a, a bad deal. So, you know, for guys like us, uh, I even have had friends who say, oh, you know, 
And you do that, you're going to get divorced. You're going to lose half your property. <laughs> you know, what's the point lose of that? So, I mean, I, I think it's important that more and more uh, as Americans, as Christians, as Catholics, we talk about the merit, the, the merit of marriage. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, you've been married, what, a, a year now or not quite? A year, yeah, actually now going on 13 or 14 months. Good. So I've got a vast array of experiences in marriage, you know, <laughs> all, all, all this one year. Um, <laughs> marriage and that you're going to lose half your property and all your kids, which is uh, don't marry a feminist. This isn't a terribly difficult problem. <laughs> you know, if you marry somebody for whom marriage really doesn't mean anything, then uh, what are you doing? Are you really being married at all? I suppose it depends on how you do it. But if you find yourself a wonderful gal like I did with sweet little Elisa, then it's just the most wonderful thing. I mean, I told you guys I fell away. I was an atheist for 10 years. I did pretty much everything wrong. And uh, what that means is doing everything the culture told me to do delay marriage, don't do that, date a lot of girls, do everything. And uh, I asked a friend of mine before I got married, I said, uh, I think I should do. It is the greatest decision I've ever made. I should have done it earlier. It brings you into society. It brings you into adulthood. It is so full and wonderful. And I, got, I thought, gosh, this is the total opposite of what the culture tells me. And I in this past year, I'll tell you, I guess I'm still a newlywed. I'm still in that honeymoon phase. It is the greatest thing ever. I just love it. My life has improved a zillion percent. My poor wife's life has probably gotten much, much worse. But listen, marriage is about <laughs> compromises. And it's it's just terrific. I really urge all of my friends. I have so many in New York and L.A. and D 30s or 40s. Married who don't really want to get married. And I say, like, guys, do it tomorrow. Find a girl on the street and just make it happen because it's uh, really <laughs> not a great a improvement to your not a feminist. life. But not a feminist, yeah. Find so. a girl Look walking careful. the street. No, 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 not that. A random, yeah, a get... random street walker. Yeah, right. you've got to really choose your words carefully here. Right. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. This coming from the guy who's getting calls from all over the Internet. <laughs> your number is everywhere. It is uh, everywhere. I, re I When I picked up, you know, it's funny, though, because big tech knows everything about us. So I don't care that my number is on the Internet. I don't care that probably Google and everybody has everything. The ancestry companies have my DNA. There are probably 10 clones of me walking around Arizona somewhere. I just it's, it's so uh, past that at this point. But it is funny because I do get random texts. One time I got a call and uh, I said, hello. And they said, is this Michael Knowles? I said, yeah. They said, Michael, I'm just calling you to let you know that you should probably take your number off Instagram. <laughs> that's, oh, that's a very helpful phone call. Thank you very much. <laughs> Super. <laughs> so do you answer so, your phone? I, I've stopped answering my phone. Yeah. Because all kinds of people call me and they have all these strains, you know, questions like, would you baptize a Martian? And what do you think about Medjugorje? And what do you think about this Portuguese word in the third secret of Fatima and all that? So I just don't even pick up. Wait, those were all my calls. Yeah, I know. That's right. you tell actually, Tim, that? I was thinking about What's up, it. What's up, D? I was thinking yeah. about Tim. The only person in the past two or three years who's made it through the crazies on my phone is you. Really? Does yeah, that I'm, mean I'm one of the crazies? Yeah, he's no, 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 no. You, you were like a guy who called me. Kind. Yeah. You, were, you were a guy who called me, and I usually was just like, oh, man, I need to get out of this. But I was like, well, this guy's actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I wonder I wonder why I made it through. I, I tried Michael, too, and he... he uh, yeah, no, I yeah. got his number off the internet though, and so, like everyone else. And so we it's became true. friends. Yeah, right away. Tim, uh, Tim called. He said, "Hey," uh, I said, "Hello." He said, "Hey, is this Michael or Katie?" And Katie helps me with booking. And I said, "Well, it's definitely not Katie, so uh, it's got to be the other guy." <laughs> well, I thought that was your <laughs> well, other personality. It yeah, it could be. Yeah, Michael or Katie, depending on the day, even <laughs> on. <laughs> now, Michael, which, you went to you went to Yale, right? I did, yeah. Okay, so were you an atheist at Yale or were you a Catholic? I was a full-on atheist, okay. I, except, I, I don't know, maybe that's not quite fair, because I, the second I got to Yale, I mean, Yale is a famously atheistic place. Bill Buckley wrote his first book about that called God and Man God at and Yale. Yeah, yeah. I... I noticed all my classmates were pretty smart. I mean, almost all of them were really sharp guys, and they were all atheists. But I noticed the smartest of them were Christian or Jews. I mean, they believed in God. And then I noticed the very smartest seemed to come from a, a 
greater or longer Christian tradition. You know, they were Catholic, they were Eastern Orthodox, they were trending toward Catholic. And I thought, that's pretty strange. I wonder what that's about. I wonder what that means. And it, uh, I, I quickly learned the lesson of um, Dr. Johnson, which is that all shallows are clear and shallow thinking is clear and shallow ideas are clear and perky and deep and they go deeper than that. And at the very least, what it gave me was a wake up call that I'm not the cleverest guy in the world and a little dose of intellectual humility. And so uh, Ernest Hemingway describes going bankrupt as it happening gradually, then suddenly. And I would say about 18 is when the gradually started. And I, I probably during college would have said, yes, I'm, I'm convinced God exists. You know, I've heard the, uh, I really liked Alvin Plantinga's modal ontological argument for God, uh, the reformulation from St. Anselm of Canterbury. Yeah. Now, now I have some issues with it, actually, but. And intellectually believe that God exists, but I certainly didn't practice anything. That, that didn't happen until uh, several years after I graduated, or uh, one, one or two years after I graduated. All right. So like when you at home, would you go to Christmas? Occasionally. I mean, I would, I would be willing to go to church in a kind of cultural way. I, or later on, I would be drawn to church as a, because I understood or I intuited that there's something going on here that I don't really understand. There's something that is, that is drawing me here. There's some, maybe some reason. God and maybe a similar concept of God. And maybe there's a reason why our civilization has been totally animated by Christianity. Maybe there's a reason why the apostles went and died because of the resurrection. They went and died not just for some silly legend that they were, or some lie that they were trying to pass off. Maybe they were really motivated by the truth. All of that was compelling me toward it. But uh, the, the whole picture didn't click into place until after graduation. Yeah, your, your reconversion sounds a lot like mine. I've recently begun to take issue with the term reversion because it's it's what I allegedly reverted to was nothing like the, the sort of piss poor, see through, tawdry Catholicism that we were all raised with in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. Yep. So I, 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 I'm in search of a a better term than revert. It's not conversion that describes like Taylor coming to the faith from not even a nominal version of itself. What do, what do you think of that? Reversion, conversion, how do you, how do you describe it? My story is similar to you, yours. It's, it's Augustine-like. It was a slow, ambling, intellectual reawakening in the faith, and then the will was converted last. But what, what do you think of this? I've well, especially with speaking of Augustine, and it involved a lot of Lord make me chased, but not yet. That certainly was a big factor in it as well. Uh, I, I agree. I don't use the word reversion very seriously. I mean, when I use the word revert, I do it almost a little tongue in cheek because it, it, uh, of course, it doesn't describe what actually happened. I didn't revert to felt banners and those sickly saccharine uh, 70s pop hymns that are usually heretical and never were cool, never were beautiful. So I'm not, I'm not reverting to anything like that, though I am referring to the faith. I mean, in, in the sense that uh, un unlike uh, versions of uh, heresy or or more abstracted ideas of Christianity, that it's just some idea or that it's only happening kind of in my perception or in my will. I mean, my baptism is real. The sacraments are real. And I, I really was baptized into the faith. So in that way, I would defend the term. But I agree, it, it doesn't really describe the, the whole uh, transformative process that happened or what uh, in an intellectual or liturgical or, or even spiritual way we are going back to. Yeah, I think that's helpful too, because my guess on this, I think what's going on here is in the nineties and two thousands, there was, you know, there was this sort of celebrity convert culture in the Catholic church, right? Like we got this guy, yep. we got this guy, a lot of ex Protestant pastors like myself. And so that was kind of a cool scene to be in in the Catholic church, like the convert scene. And so there was this whole revert scene, right? Which was kind right. of like, well, we're the kind of like the converts, but I, I, I like what you guys are saying because you guys, 
you know, you did receive baptism, you did receive confirmation, you did go to confession at least once, I presume, you know, yeah. as a child. And so, <laughs> you know, we all of us in our Catholic life fall down and make mistakes, uh, maybe even commit mortal sins. When we go to confession, we don't call that reverting per se. I guess if you like left the Catholic first uh, Catholic Church and you are professed Buddhist or something, right? Maybe you came back. You call that reverb, but I'm not sure. So it's interesting to see see guys like you and how you articulate where you you know there and back again. You know where how that whole thing shaked out. And there there is also this aspect you know of going away toward another religion. You see this a lot. In, especially in New York, people will take on this sort of quasi-Buddhist spirituality that... Yeah, yoga pants Buddhism. That's right, yoga pants Buddhism, and then you eat an acai bowl afterward, and that's your liturgy or something. Right. But the, <laughs> there, there is, and we see this reflected in, in the data, this huge number of people, particularly millennials and Gen Z, who are spiritual but not religious, which is to say they don't care that much about God, but they're very interested in themselves. They sort of intuit that there is a metaphysical world, but they don't want to actually do anything about it. And that has become a, a real religion. I mean, everybody's got to serve somebody. Uh, the, you know, I think there's a common misconception that religious people are superstitious. Subscribe to true or the least superstitious people in the world, and it's often self-proclaimed materialists or atheists or the spiritual but not religious who are the most superstitious. They're reading astrology. They're they're tr transforming their diets. They believe in these kind of new age Gnostic dualist ideas. I mean, particularly in the transgender movement, they're adopting this idea. On the one hand, they say the the metaphysical world doesn't exist. We are only material. On the other hand, I am not my body. My body has nothing to do with what and who I am. Even if I appear to be a man physically, level, I'm actually, and how do I know that? Couldn't tell you. What does that mean? I don't have a soul, so I can't use that. There's just this kind of Gnostic idea. And so they, they seem to me to be like the most religious of anybody. And, and that's, that's where I think the reverts are converting away from is this kind of vague saccharine, new agey uh, cult of the self. Yeah. That's right. It, it's surprising, too, that, that that group is very dogmatic. You look on Twitter, Facebook, what's going on in demonetizing platforms, YouTube. Uh, they're more prolific than the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> You're telling me. They're everywhere, I mean, shutting things down. And, uh, you know, there's nothing free thinking about it, even they even though they profess that. Um, and I worry where it's going in America. I think, you know, all three of us, um, you know, are concerned about that because we're definitely the ones who are targeted um, when it comes to LGBT. See, right now the Amazon, uh, I mean, the, the uh, YouTube bots are, are listening to this. And they're hearing this LGBT demonetize yeah. uh, abortion <laughs> translate demonetize. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, there was yeah, that story that, that the guy who worked at YouTube said that they were scanning YouTube channels and looking for words in of the course. audio. Yeah, in the of audio. Of course, you know, I, I did an interview on my show with Father Mike Schmitz, and we were talking about his book on marriage. If anything, it was a little bit of a dry episode, you know. This is not the uh, right. hottest topic, and, you know, talking to a Catholic priest about marriage. And they uh, censored it. They censored it. They demonetized it. They restricted its reach. This has happened to a, a number of our videos. And what's so difficult about it is that it's an issue of transparency. So we never know what the rules are on YouTube. Right. We never know what the rules are in the culture. We were told two months ago that if you use the word queer, it's like using a racial slur and you can lose your YouTube channel for it. They tried to kick the conservative comedian Steve Crowder off of the platform. Then Colorado State University, just a week or two ago, published a, an inclusive language guide that said that actually you can now never use the word homosexual because that's for some reason been forbidden. Now you have to use the word queer. And if you don't use queer, then you're going to be kicked off YouTube. But if you do use queer, then you're going to be kicked off YouTube. It's constantly changing so that we can talk yeah. to the censors and gatekeepers and ask them what we are allowed to say. And it's not just a play for political power. 
though it is. I mean, they are certainly trying to use the law to limit what we can say, limit what we can think. They are trying to use the culture to limit what we can say and think. But specifically when you get to the realm of gender ideology, which, you know, gender confusion afflicts 0.2% of people just about, and yet it's dominated our social discourse. What it really comes down to, I think, is turning it up from a political and a cultural power grab all the way to an ontological power grab to say that the left and only the left has the power to decide the nature of reality itself and that might change, but it will change according to the dictates of the left. And if you disagree, you will be shunned, you will be ostracized, you will be silenced, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And it's, it's especially bothersome when you're a parent because they get to define family, they get to define education, they get to define health care, which could include uh, changing your gender. Or if your child says it once at school, you could lose your child out of your home. Uh, all of these things, right, will be invasive and invade traditional family life. So they will not only just control the public discourse, but they might actually just control the next generation because these people don't tend to breed like we do. You know, I got eight kids. Tim's got, you know, more on the way. You've got some coming. These people don't tend to have children. So the only way they can get the next generation is to steal them. This is right. You know, one time I was trying to get Mitch Daniels, the former governor of Indiana, to run for president. This was around 2011, 2012. And actually, Mitch now is at Purdue University. At university. At that time, he gave a speech to us, and he was talking about all the political uh, difficulties coming down the pike and all the ways that we can defeat this secular, you know, uh, big spending, aggressive political left. And he said, boys, these are the ways that you can do it at the ballot box and here and in the culture and da, 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 da. He said, but don't forget, we can also outbreed them. And I'll tell you from experience, that way is a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, they used to call this the biological solution, I except in the 70s and 80s. Uh, what I find interesting is the biological solution was waiting out the the radicals who had crept into the church just waiting for them to die you know the, the the dinosaurs the true believers in the worst aspects of the council that of course didn't work because radicals are are radical they're aggressive they they never flinch and they never back down the biological solution that works that's that's yes quite fun you you have to give it to your, your mentor that is is uh, outbreeding them but this only works if we're pointing out the contradictions like you were just doing, Michael. I mean, none of these leftist interest groups, if we're being if we're having a long enough memory, can really speak to one another. Right. The uh, the care group, the, the pro Islamic group, the feminist group, the the LGBT, you know, feminists can't decide whether or not they like LGBT uh, if, for really obvious reasons. If you have a long enough memory. Right. What you know, what oh. do you say to that? Of course, because you're actually seeing this playing out right at this very moment, and it will be decided eventually by the Supreme Court with the issue of women's sports. So you yep. have two pet victim groups of the left. You have women, and you have people who are confused about their biological sex, transgender, right. gender ideology. And they're duking it out over Title IX, Title whether IX. or not sex will also include identity. And here is an irreconcilable difference, an irreconcilable conflict. On the one hand, Title IX establishes women's sports leagues because there cannot be discrimination on the basis of sex. Men are physically stronger than women, so if men compete in the same sports leagues, they will beat them. Women are allowed to have their own sports leagues. Title IX sets up women's sports leagues. If we interpret that to include gender identity, the idea that we're not talking about the basis of sex, but simply what one believes about one's own sex, you abolish women's sports leagues. You can have one or the other. You can have a... You can have... The left doesn't really care, though, because they tend to just abandon their old pet victim groups as they become less, less and less politically useful and move on. And it's this great point that you made, which is you can't just wait them out. I mean, from a you know, purely political standpoint, we were told in 2016 by a lot of people who would call themselves conservative, it's better for Hillary to win. 
It's better for a lot of leftist judges to get on the court. It's better that we'll never have a shot at overturning Roe. It's better that you will see your religious liberty destroyed. It's, it's better to wait them out. Who's a little bit of a volatile candidate. Because look, we'll get them next time. You, you can't wait them out but by the radicals. They are going to aggress and aggress and aggress. Nobody wins a game by lying down and doing nothing. And you see this at the political level, the cultural level, and within the church as well. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the uh, invasion into education? I mean, they've, they've basically slam dunk the college university system. And I think we're going to get to a point in which they say for the professors, people like me, if you do not sign on to our LGBT diversity agreement, you lose tenure, you lose your job, you're not welcome here. Uh, this also has to do with publishing and journals. Uh, you, you basically are, are disbarred from academia. I think we're probably only a couple of years away from that. It's already happening. You're, you really are already seeing this. I mean, I have a lot of friends in the academy who are already being forced to sign these sorts of agreements. So looking down the road, you know, get excited for it. Right. This, uh, this is where you, you see really, I think, a unity of purpose among all sorts of conservatives. It's not a cow. You saw this fight break out at first things with Sorab Amari and David French at National Review. And it was basically an argument between traditionalists and cultural conservatives and libertarians and classical liberals. And on the one side, you had a, the people arguing that the end of politics is the good and virtue, and the, the other side saying, no, the end of politics is maximizing individual autonomy. That is the good in and of itself. And in that battle, I tend to agree with the traditionalists and the cultural conservatives. But where you see the two sides come right together is in As John Adams said, that our Constitution is built for a moral and religious people. It's unfit to the governance of any other sort of people. You, and for virtue to be uh, acted upon, you need to choose virtue. It requires an act of the will. It requires your choice and your participation in that. But the only way you get a moral and religious people is by forming them in education at home and obviously in schools. The trouble is education is a definitionally coercive act. Uh, are ignorant, students are being taught what to think, they're being taught how to think, and so how you do that has an element of coercion to it. Because state and an increasingly atheistic and leftist state has taken over education uh, and now is making a bigger play to take it over by going into the colleges, forgiving student loans, taking an unprecedented power grab over colleges and universities, you're seeing uh, that, that state action imposing over the course of time a, a morality that we would find unrecognizable to any moral truth. Th that's going on right now, and the universities are the crystal ball. So when, when you see the craziness on the universities, look down the road 20 years, that's the country you're going to have. It was true in the 1960s. We saw that bear out a generation later. Uh, was the religious and conservatives have abandoned the universities. We basically let the secular left have it. And that was a huge mistake. The lesson that we should take from that is you do have to stand your ground. You do have to fight. Uh, th there are extraordinarily negative consequences to lethargy and cowardice. Yeah, the, the French Amari debate is one that's near my heart and for, for reasons. A lot of us uh, sympathetic to to uh, Amari's type of arguments, you know the the, the so-called post liberals. I'm I'm very sympathetic to all those premises, um, and and of course I'm I'm not really any more sympathetic to to David Frenchism than I ever was. There there seems to be a false dichotomy there, and um, yeah, you know, I make this point in my book Catholic Republic. I, I I won't I don't really like using David French as the paradigm instance, but Right. See what you think about this, Michael. I think that generally speaking, the post liberals have the correct premises, and something like classical liberals, just just the Catholic version, Thomists, uh, have the correct conclusions. And so it's 
I'm not a proponent typically of third way type arguments like distributism is a middle way between socialism and capitalism. I think that's bunk. I right. think I've I, I think I, I think there's a legitimate middle way between so-called, you know, Amari style integralists, which has become very trendy, you've noted, and uh, and the so-called classical liberals, which really that that point of view shouldn't even be available to enlightenment or post enlightenment or post Protestant thinkers. But w my point is this, I think you're sympathetic because I've seen you a bit on social media. I started out very sympathetic to Saurabh Amari, but now they, they just keep going. There, there needs to be something, someone from a traditional point of view, maybe it could be you because you're a big name to say, yeah, I, uh, culturally speaking, we need to be traditional. This is the only way for, for culture or politics to survive. But look where these guys that are pushing for an integrated church state always end up going. Assault weapons bans. Yeah. Bad, bad, yeah. bad. It's getting very alienating very fast. Yeah, very, yeah I, I agree with that. And it's funny because, you know, I, I like David French a lot. I think he was in some ways an imperfect avatar for what uh, So Rob was talking about. In, in particular, because David has made his career defending religious liberty. Um, but, you know, let's as it I agree, and I am uh, more inclined towards So Rob's argument, but I agree. I, I think this is a false dichotomy. And in the United States, traditionalists are conserving, in part, a liberal tradition. And that's just a fact. And uh, to, to pretend that that isn't the case is uh, just as utopian as any leftist fantasy. The, the one area where I, I do think that the traditionalists have it is on using the state to uh, establish certain premises because of education itself. So the, the, the state is not a, a merely neutral institution. It will I true virtues or it will value the pretend made up virtues of inclusion and tolerance and diversity, which in practice actually mean the opposite of inclusion and tolerance and diversity. I think specifically on education, that, that's where you, you'd have to see that come out. And then I would urge with the classical liberals some caution about giving the state uh, too much, uh, too, uh, giving into the state's haughtiness to tell us what to do in other realms because, for instance, some of the arguments being made by those more traditionalist types or that, that branch of conservatism on, say, the so-called assault ridiculous arguments. I mean, they are, uh, there, there was a, an editorial in the, Wash or in the New York Post the other day talking about why we need to ban the AR-15 that just did not make any sense. I love the New York Post. I like the editorial board there, but it was, it was a really bad editorial, and it shows you some of the, uh, the limits and some of the weaknesses of empowering the state beyond where it, where it really ought to be. Yeah, and the problem with a lot of these traditionalists, I like the New York Post and their editorial board as well, by the way, but a lot of these guys will talk about G.K. Chesterton as representing so-called tradition before they'll talk about Thomas Aquinas, right. who absolutely right. affirmed that republicanism, small r, is one of the three adequate regimes, and this comes down from Plato and Aristotle. And these guys don't know it. They literally think it was invented by John Locke or Algernon Sidney or something. It's, it's absurd. They need to be informed because they're otherwise reasonable people. Of course. And, you know, look, I love, I love Chesterton as much as the next guy, and I quote his lines all the time, but uh, the man was not the be-all and end-all of economic thought. And I, when I'm discussing the moral basis for economics, I prefer to quote uh, John Paul II and Pope Leo XIII in particular, uh, who does not Pope Leo XIII doesn't really try to find a middle way on socialism. He's pretty clear calling confederacy and an evil and wicked confederacy. I mean, I think that uh, the more traditionalist-minded conservatives should uh, keep going back further and further in their tradition and not just stop at Leo XIII. I mean, even on the question of gun control, you had uh, Pope Leo XII, who would regularly shoot doves in the Vatican Garden, and you had Pope St. Pius V, who actually made a deal with the Beretta Company, Beretta, the same company that makes our guns, to, uh, to uh, fund and uh, help supply the troops in the Battle of Lepanto, which saved Western civilization. So if you're going to be a traditionalist, you really got to take it. That's right. Well, yeah, 
<laughs> Chesterton, Chesterton didn't take a middle way on capitalism, socialism either. He was like, uh, you know, right. he was a, right. a Fabian, Fabian socialist, a huge enthusiast of the French Revolution. We don't have to get it. JP two and, and Leo the Thirteenth didn't take a middle way. They were on the right side. Yeah, uh, Chesterton right. and Belloc, they were they were firmly committed to the left side. I, I don't know how this this myth grew so out of control, but but yeah, it's because we like them so much in every other thing that they wrote about right. that we try to forgive them for distributism. But it's uh, that's a losing right. proposition. Yeah. All right, let's let's talk a little bit about um, abortion. I, I'm, I'm sure you've been following it, Michael. And um, my take on it, is it seems that in the past year, I don't know if it's because of the movie. Uh, unplanned. I don't know if it's because of social media and the things that have been passed around, but it seems that there's been a a little bit of a groundswell in a in a bump up for the pro life movement. Um, of course, I loved your mocking of my uh, Miley Cyrus on her her kid. I'm going to put that image up. You guys won't see it. But I'm going to put it up for people. So here's close oh, your wait, eyes that's, if you're that's easily you. uh, here's Miley. scarred, <laughs> scandalized. She's got abortion yeah. is health care. And then Michael fired back. He put a taxation is that. But that that's pretty funny right there. I love that. Um, yeah. So I mean, where that's do you think we're going? Do you, journalism do you think that we, we have do here a little on bit Michael of Moore momentum show. now, right now. We we absolutely do. I mean, I suppose in part it's because of the movies and Unplanned and uh, people speaking out in the culture. I think a lot of it is because of sonograms. I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to something Science. as simple as a technological advancement, yes, because the the argument for abortion never made any sense. And you saw this most clearly in Hillary Clinton's argument that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare, uh, you know, as though if, it, if it's murder, obviously it shouldn't be legal. And if it classic Clintonian trying to have both sides, you had some feminists who were a little more honest about it. Naomi Wolf in the 1990s said, we must admit that the fetus is a baby and we must kill it in all of its humanity in order to have equal rights for women. Ruth Bader Ginsburg said almost as much. And so you had the, the people who were being honest on the left and in the pro-abortion movement, they were uh, presenting the argument, which is that you've got to be able to kill babies for some perverse idea of women's equality. But I think the vast majority of abortion supporters just didn't think about it. They didn't know what was going on inside the belly. They didn't want to think about it. Grams, they're just kind of like a blurry little blob. And now, I mean, we have 3D sonograms. You can see that as early as, what, 10 days, I mean, 15 days, that this thing looks a whole lot like a human. And so when you see it with your eyes, I mean, this is something that I see in Hollywood all the time. The image is so much more important in changing public discourse than the logical argument is. And when the image can validate the arguments that we've been making, which is that obviously human life begins at the conception of human life, and it is a human life, it's not a platypus or a giraffe, it is a human, and, and it is an match that argument, then I think you see gradually, then suddenly, a, a great swell in support for pro-life. It also seems that the left has been been more vocal with the shout your abortion, be proud of your abortion. And I think for a lot yeah. of a lot of people in the middle, they find that gross. It's it's too much, like they're overplaying their hand. Of course, and they they can't help it though because there is a great deal of shame that comes along with this, and a, a real cynicism, a real grisly worldview that would have you defend the killing of a. live with that cognitive dissonance. So I think they it can't simply be the case that abortion is a tragic thing that society will permit as a matter of law because it's an imperfect society and, and we compromise on legislation. It has to be a positive good. I mean, there was a study out from the Guttmacher Institute that, which is a pro-abortion institute, but nevertheless, it, it suggested that one in four women has had at least one abortion by age 40. Uh, I am simply not uh, qualified to look through the methodologies of that, though I've had certain uh, statistics expert friends look 
you do live in a society where one in four women has had an abortion, imagine the role that shame plays in that. And if you have done it and you're unwilling to say, gosh, that was a horrible decision, I'm so sorry, God, please forgive me, then really your only other alternative is, yes, I did a good thing. My baby would have been happy that I killed it. I am so moral. I, Lena Dunham said, I haven't had an abortion, but I wish I had an abortion. I mean, it's that kind of illogical logical conclusion of their premises that I think people are seeing and they're saying, oh gosh, I guess the argument was wrong from the very beginning. Yeah. Tim, how, you've been doing some research on this. What, what is the, the earliest outright feminist uh, advocacy or argument for abortion? Oh, abortion, that's a good question. The, the earliest outright feminist advocacy for basically everything that we associate with feminism, um, the sort of forced uh, intemperance, sexual intemperance by females, getting into the priesthood, getting women out of the homes, and there was a lot of rhetoric, uh, sexual rhetoric about getting them out of the homes. I suspect it's there. It goes back to the earliest possible iteration of first wave feminism, which is just evil. It's everything you see in so-called second wave feminism is back as far back as 1848. There's uh, a meeting called the Seneca Falls Convention with a memorialized document called the uh, Declaration of, of Sentiments, which I think is, is funny that those gals got together and came up with a Declaration of Sentiments. And it's it's uh, it's. Instead of the Declaration of Independence, uh, after which it was modeled, it's called the Declaration of Sentiments. Yeah, not the Declaration of Reason, not the Declaration of <laughs> Arguments. It's no, no, the Declaration no. of Sentiments. Okay. De declaration of Feelings and Moods or whatnot. <laughs> uh, and and it, it, it literally has in it, as a kind of black pill, I don't know, everything associated, bullet point, line item for line item, with second wave feminism. And yet conservatives are afraid to touch this because, you know, the, the, the kind of I don't know how the left does this. I, this is a question I, I wanted to ask you, but particularly with regard to feminism. How do we say there's a, a pro-life feminist or a Christian feminist? It seems to have something to do with their in, their, you know, indefatigable ability, the left to infiltrate everything. Right. Right. Taylor's book title to infiltrate everything where even you know, the conservative intelligentsia are going about this with this foolish motto on their lips. Well, but first wave feminism isn't bad or well, all I'm critiquing is radical feminism, radical Islam. It's like, but if these are if these right. are core principles of feminism, as the scholarship shows, I was shocked. 1848, you know, well before people even thought first wave feminism began in the 1860s, 70s, you have line item, all these things. How is the left, particularly, I think, the beating heart of the left, feminism, how is it so able to infiltrate even conservative ranks? That's what I'm always after. Be because it's shameless. I think that's why, and I think that's why conservatives are so uh, at a disadvantage here, is generally speaking, conservatives own lives. We have nice lives. We are by definition uh, better adjusted to the realities of this world than the left, which is just screechy and angry all the time. And they want to fundamentally transform America, to quote Barack Obama. They want to, to quote John F. Kennedy, who was then quoting the socialist playwright George Bernard Shaw and the atheist George Bernard Shaw. He said, uh, George Bernard Shaw wrote, some people see things that are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. What he fails to mention is that line comes from the play Back to Methuselah, and it's the words of the serpent in the garden tempting Eve. I mean, it's just right out there in the open. You it, it is this antipathy toward reality. It is a preference for fantasy. You see it in Alice in Wonderland. Humpty Dumpty says to Alice, in my world, in my language, words can mean whatever I want them to mean. Alice says... Uh, the question is, can words really mean all those things? And he said, the question is, which is to be master? That is all. And, that, and the, the left would be master by redefining everything, by, ma by changing all of our definitions. And the right would be master by using words precisely. So especially, you see the culmination of it in the 1960s, when the left political is the personal, such that there's no distinction anymore between personal and public. 
we are going to infiltrate every level of the society, not just the Congress, not just the White House. We're going down to the family. We're going down to the crib. This is a, uh, a, a shamelessness. They don't care how they are perceived. They don't care how screechy they look. And we conservatives, because we want to kind of get along with people and be nice guys, we're willing to accept many of their premises while rejecting their most radical ones. So we'll say, oh, yeah, we, we love first wave feminism. No, we, that's fine. We're okay with that. We just don't just shoot my old child hormones and mutilate his body. But please, but we're happy to accept. I like second wave feminism too. I mean, we're just, we're just too nice about it. And uh, because of that, we're just at a real cultural disadvantage in fighting a, an endless, never ending political and cultural bully. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It, it goes back to the, the philosophical debates. You see it in, arising in the 14th century. Realism, I mean, it actually goes back to Socrates and Plato. Realism, nominalism. They're yeah. either real essence, real forms and things like me and you. Like, I'm a male, I'm a human, I'm baptized, all those things. Or we just put our names and our tags and our labels on what we want. And, like, it goes back to the quote from Alice in Wonderland, you know, whoever is master gets to hang the labels and the tags. And yep. secular governments have always loved nominalism because they get to control all the labels, all the tags. And that means they get all the power. I think the LGBT, the abortion, and you've met, you referenced it earlier too, Michael, is it's who can control the thoughts and the labels. That's way yeah, more important than who controls the money. Of right? course. I mean, you see this now, this tendency toward nominalism is, uh, I guess it's been going on for a very long time, but it is, it is really increasing in uh, vigor. And it's, it's difficult to argue against it in a culture that is that denies objective truth because it's so convenient. I mean, you, you know, it's so convenient to say, oh, there aren't any real categories. Look, what's a man and what's a woman? It's all just kind of a spectrum. What's sexuality? It's all just kind of a spectrum. What is uh, sin and what is virtue? It's all just kind of a spectrum. Uh, nothing is except, uh, no nothing is good or bad except that thinking makes it so. And uh, because this is convenient to whole swaths of people, then uh, it's uh, very difficult for us to make an argument to the contrary. Yeah. And, and the irony is, you know, all these people living in San Francisco and Oregon and or at Chicago or whatever else, they don't understand that the people who are going to hang those labels aren't, aren't the hippies. It's going to be the powerful political, corporate, financial powers of the world who will eventually get to decide all of those things everything on the chessboard they get to decide and they will not consult the lowly transgender teenager you know living in whatever town they will go for a complete takeover of of society. course of course i mean that is that is the play they they uh, if if i were consumed as the left is with just accumulating and amassing and centralizing power, why would I be content with just some particular amount of political power when I could take over the control to redefine reality itself? I mean, that's, that's the ultimate, and that has, that's, seems to be the uh, end of, of the philosophical premises that they've, they've had for a long time. Right. And it's yeah. ultimate, I mean, as, as Christians, as Catholics, we know it as its origin is ultimately Satan. I mean, that's that's the cry right. of, of Satan and all the demons. I will not serve. I will be like unto God. You know, St. Michael, Mikael, who is like God? That's, that's the true believer's refrain. Who is like God? Not you, Lucifer. But Satan says, no, God is essentially ontologically God, but I will name myself nominalism. I will name myself as a God, and I'm going to push it as far as I can go. So, I mean, ultimately, this is a, it's a spiritual battle. And we can we can dice out the the, the philosophy and the economics. Of course, but. this is the the one area I, I hate to uh, you know give credit to uh, Marianne Williamson on anything, the New Age guru and probably future president of the United States. But she did say that uh, we're not really just arguing over marginal tax rates; we're arguing over dark psychic forces. And of course, she's right. Uh, now, the dark psychic force isn't Donald Trump; it's the devil himself. But uh, people, I think, intuit that as the spiritual reality in our politics and our society. And uh, when you boil, when you boil it all down, that's what it comes down to. 
Right. But we want to we want to be careful. I want to push back against both of you. Now, I don't think you're intentionally doing this, but we don't want to over a temporalize or spiritualize it. It's it's a spiritual battle. It's also a a, a bodily battle. And yep. um, I mean, leftism is a hatred of nature. It's an ontological resentment. Spiritually speaking, yeah, Lucif- Luciferianism or, or whatever. It, it was a rejection of God. Uh, you know, known Sir William. But it's also just a rejection of the natural order. And I, I find it very funny. I, I mean, y- you both get this. It's really funny when, when a secular leftist says to a person of, of uh, Christian background that you, you hate science or you hate nature or the order of reality. It's like, I accept whatever it is. I'm a Roman Catholic, baby. You know, like this is why Stalin and Mao <laughs> banned uh, quantum mechanics is because it proves our 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 ontology but it, alexandria ocasio cortez wants to ban cows because it contradicts her political vision of the world you know my Seriously. political vision includes cows in it so i think maybe i'm a little more in line with nature and and the world order <laughs> yeah my, my political vision includes cows for better or for worse from their point of view <laughs> cows really for plate. worse cows, yeah, on, my cows on my before we get too far off of uh, lgbt um I, I just got off of yours, uh, the way the joke goes. I want to I um, make, make this reference. Uh, I think you said at the very beginning, Michael, of the Summer of Shame to Ali Beth Stuckey that you didn't think there was much of a correlation between um, homosexualism and the priesthood, which is, by the way, the only place where I think LGBT is really this code red crisis is in yeah. the Roman Catholic preliture. Uh, and the sexual abuse crisis that was before to be fair that was way before a lot of the the good data has come out the yeah. pennsylvania grand jury report do you care to do you stick by that or do you it, i mean no it, i mean i was going off of the uh the john jay report that came out and so i took it for, for what it was worth but yeah the from since then that this would seem to uh this would seem not to be the case. And it, it does, th- those who have been promoting the John Jay report have been uh, doing so, I, I think, maybe not out of a preference for a cold, hard look at the data, but because they're trying to push a political agenda. But particularly looking at the uh, Pennsylvania grand jury report, it is difficult not to notice the coincidence, the fact that a relaxation of sexual mores among the priesthood uh, particularly with regard to the LGBTQ issue, has coincided with sexual abuse. And so I, I don't know if there's going to be a follow-up to that John Jay report, but in light of all that we've seen over the past couple of years, uh, it's, it's hard not to ask that question and say, wait a second, for those who are so insistent that there is no correlation between, uh, say, the LGBTQ agenda in the Catholic Church and the sexual abuse crisis, what came first, the the information or your conclusion, and then you're trying to find information to back it up? Yeah, where I come from, four out of five is a, a shit ton of correlation, if yeah. we're, we're being honest. Right. And, and, you know, you could either crunch the numbers or you could just go read Plato's Symposium. You know, I mean, there there is a long – and this is actually what got Milo Yiannopoulos in so much hot water, crossfire from the left and the right, one, because he's partly affirming it, but – I don't think he meant to as much as it sounded. I mean, literally, there is, even going back to ancient Greece, a strong, strong correlation between, not not pedophilia, but what we call ephebophilia or pederasty, uh, a young man being initiated into the, the homo underworld by an older man. I mean, it's right there in Plato. So right. that I, I, whenever good philosophy tends to line up with good number crunching, usually I'm all in. And I, I know I know you're the same way. So. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And and it, it does uh, it, it also puts the spotlight back, back on those particularly those within the Catholic Church who are so insistent on this political point. And you see a lot of people, uh, priests, people who are uh, who seem to be peddling at least borderline heresy. And you ask what what their preference is. Do they want to push a particular view of the sexual revolution and political leftism in the Catholic Church or do they want to defend the faith? in the fullness of the faith. And uh, the, the problem appears much more widespread than I think I, I was willing to acknowledge earlier. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Paul Sullins report has, has been a nice follow-up because it, it shows this, it, you know, it was released later, but, you know, it shows this correlation of, of the 80% 
uh, of being the yeah. pederasty uh, element. So it's still getting chased out. I mean, just this past week, uh, did you guys see the um, the letters were released of of McCarrick of his of his grooming of the young men? Did you see that, Tim? I didn't. Yeah, yeah. James no. Grind once again re- uh, revealing some things, and so you you, you kind of see the way that the the initiation or the grooming, all, all that that was going on in that culture. But you know, the sad thing is, is you have a spiritual superior, a leader, a cardinal, archbishop, monsignor, father, who's who's the one who's initiating these initiations. You know, right? Really and if, you know, I, I've talked to people. I won't won't use any names, but uh, younger priest friends who have said they were warned about McCarrick. You, you know, even as seminarians or as young priests, not, not anything about uh, underage predation, but predation specifically on seminarians and priests. And it was obviously known for a long time and he got away with it for a long time. Yeah. And, and imagine for the, imagine those seminarians, imagine their life, you know, imagine for those young priests, what that does to, uh, you know, you've just entered into this vocation and to see this rank, horrific corruption in totally jarring, totally transformative. Yeah. yeah, it makes it makes you remember it's it's really not that bad to sleep on the floor at someone's beach house, you know? <laughs> like you you I selected you to sleep on the bed with me. We're out of we're all out of sofas and beds. Like, bro, I I did this for three months straight during our Exodus ninety. It's like I'll, I'll take the floor rather yeah, than I'll uh, sleep on the beach. bed any day. Yeah. I'll sleep on the beach, dude. I'll sleep <laughs> on the boat. Oh man. Well uh we're getting we're at we're at an hour here. Uh, maybe we should wrap up. Either of you guys have some final final thoughts before we, we close out. I could. I mean, I guess I could end on the final thoughts, which would be the sequel to my blank book. But I, I do have to say, I'll <laughs> I'll end instead on a thought, but on a note of flattery. I am such a huge fan of you guys. I think you you're doing tremendous work. I love uh, you know. I just got Catholic Republic, and I really like that. So just keep it Thanks. up, guys. I I really love everything you're doing, and I'll be. I'll be watching, you know, even when I'm not on. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, uh, we, we usually close with the prayer. Um, let's do that. We've been we've been doing the Latin. People like the Latin. I'm trying to. I'm all for the Latin. To have a, a, a revival of the Latin, and so um, we'll pray a Hail Mary in Latin. I invite. Let's see, we got uh, over 1,200 people with us right now, so I'll invite everyone out there to. To pray with us, and the prayers on the screen for everybody watching. In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et et ora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. 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 All right. Well, everyone, thanks for watching. Please like this video. Please subscribe. Please go follow uh, Michael Knowles. Where, they, where can they fo- follow you, Michael? Tell everybody. So, if you. We called twitter.com. You can find me at Michael J. Knowles. You can find the Michael Knowles Show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever those are found, always over at the Daily Wire, occasionally popping up on Fox. And you can get all of those links at michaeljknowles.com. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Pray the rosary. Stay faithful to your vocation. Uh, follow Michael on Twitter and all those outlets, and we'll put those in the show notes as well. And signing off. God bless. Thanks, guys.